we are still in the US and that is because it is a remarkable place at the moment, constantly ever evolving, so much happening, particularly on the regulatory front. So it is my absolute pleasure now to introduce our next session. We are going to dive a little bit deeper into the realm of digital asset compliance and regulation. So this is a really crucial conversation that is going to be steered by our CEO, Simon Callahan of Blockchain Australia. And this is also, sorry, Hester, also starstruck again, Hester Purse, US Securities and Exchange Commission will be joining us as well. Uh, Simon, are you ready? I will, I think you might be having some video problems, but he will be here shortly. Yeah, I don't seem to be able to get the uh, video to it. Okay. Stopped, I'm sorry. I will, are there any, sorry, Hester, uh, are there any pop-ups coming on, Simon, that are? Yeah, things start my video, but, uh, but yeah, it's. Do you want to duck out and jump back in? Yeah, let me try that, sorry. Okay. Well, while we're doing that, I can give you my disclaimer, which is uh, that. Yes. I my views are, are my own views as a commissioner and not necessarily those of the US SEC or my fellow commissioners. We get that out of the way. Um, I'm delighted to be here, though, with you. Have you, have you been looking at what Australia is doing at all um, and just sort of reflecting? Or... You know, I, I think that we've been focused. I, I heard Caitlin mention Europe, and I think everyone's been a little bit focused on Europe recently because, because they've made pretty significant progress, I think, in a short period of time. But I am curious to see what's happening in Australia because it does seem that Australia is also taking a more, um, a more measured approach, which I think will, will serve it well. Um, so we probably have a lot to learn from Australia as well. And there's Simon. <laughs> Well, I will love you both and leave you both. Have a lovely session. Oh. Thank you. Thanks, Amy Rose. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Purse, for joining us. It's really an honour to have you involved with Blockchain Way. It's, it's, I'm, I'm delighted to be there. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got a few questions. I, I want to delve into a little bit about, you, I guess, your um, you know, professional and personal journey in, in, into your position and, and how, how you found yourself interested in crypto and delve into a couple more technical questions on the regulatory front as well a bit later. Um, so just to start off, given that we've got an Australian audience, I'm, I'm just wondering if you could give us an ex, a, a explanation on your role with the SEC and, and where it involves crypto. Sure, so the SEC is um, an unusual government agency, even in the United States, in the sense that we have a five member commission that heads it. Um, and so I'm not the chairman, but there, there are five of us, one of us is the chairman, everyone knows, Chair Gensler. Um, and, and we all make decisions about all regulations. We all vote on all regulations and all enforcement actions. So there's no real um, division of labor in terms of this area goes to one commissioner and this area goes to another. We're all kind of working on everything. Um, and, and that means that crypto is part of the, obviously the enforcement docket these days. Um, but also theoretically could be part of the regulatory agenda. And, and actually it, there, it, it has popped up in some of our rulemakings now as well. And so that's, that's um, where I work, you know, where I come across this, this in my work. And of course, I'm trying desperately to learn as much about crypto as, as I can, um, because I think it is something we need to spend a little time getting the framework right now on yeah thank you and i think it has you know enormous upside potential when we start looking at um you know real world tokenization as well so um yeah really important i agree that we, we get the regulatory side um and, and i think one other important thing to for people to understand about the sec which i should have said in answer to your question the the staff reports to the chairman and the chairman sets the agenda. So often people 
you know, ask, well, what is the role of someone in, in who's, who's not the chairman? And I think it really is to, the idea is to have a balanced or politically balanced commission. Um, the idea is so that you don't have regulatory swings from one way to another, from one administration to another. Um, and it also is a way to make sure you're bringing in a wide set of perspectives on issues that are, are, are really important in our economy. And so even when I don't agree with my colleagues, I think it's, it's my uh, responsibility to raise some of the concerns I have. Yeah, understandable. Um, thank you. Um, I'm just curious in terms of your career, career if we can delve into, I guess, what led to your, when did you start paying attention to crypto? You know, what led to that? Um, you know, what led your career to the SEC and, and just more broadly, what motivates you in, in your career? Yeah, well, I'd say what motivates me in my, my career is a real passion for the capital markets, for, for a, I have a belief that the capital markets are a way to really transform people's lives. Um, as investors, you can invest and you can then build generational wealth to pass that on to your kids and grandkids. But also as a business owner, you can draw from the capital markets and you can build a business which then affects the community you, you live in and work in and, and can really spawn then other businesses. And so I think it's just such an important part of our, our, our country and our, our infrastructure here in the United States. And so being part of building that is something that I really feel is a privilege. I had not, when I, I went to law school, and I will say I had never imagined that I would work at a government regulator when I was in law school. But I did find securities law interesting because I had studied economics, and it's a nice mix of economics and law. And so I did go to a law firm that did a lot of securities work, and a lot of those people had worked at the SEC. And I realized that, I mean, they spoke very highly of the of the people there and of the work there. But I also realized that to really understand securities law, you needed to spend some time in the agency. I ended up spending a lot more time there than I had anticipated, both as a staffer and then coming back later as a commissioner. In the time between when I was on the staff of the SEC and as a commissioner, I, I had left and spent some time on Capitol Hill um, working as a staffer there, but also spent some time working at a, a financial, uh, well, it's not, it wasn't only financial, but at a regulatory um, research center where we thought about regulation from a legal and economic perspective. And some of my colleagues there were, so this was probably first time I heard about Bitcoin, I think was 2012-ish. Um, so some of my colleagues there were quite interested in Bitcoin, specifically in crypto more broadly. And so that was my first introduction. And I thought it was really um, a, fascinating, a fascinating development in sort of a societal development in the sense that people have always been able to decide what they think is money, what they think is a, a way of storing or transferring value. And here was a, a new iteration of that um, that had really the potential to transform the way the internet works because the, the ability to transfer value is something that had been really missing until that point. So I was fascinated by it, although not as fascinated as maybe I should have been in, in the sense of uh, purchasing it, <laughs> which, uh, which probably would have been wise back then. But, um, it, but in any event, um, it, it was probably wise that I didn't because I couldn't hold this job if I held crypto, so. Very, very interesting. I was going to ask if any of your colleagues back in 2012 had set up mining rigs and <laughs> well, I'm sure they had. I'm sure they had. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you, you've been. You, if, if I'm, going to, I'm going to delve into some of some of the not directly in some of the comments you've made, but you've you've been publicly critical of some of the decisions that the SEC has made jointly. I think you've given us a little more insight into you know, the five commissioner structure and, and how that works. But um, I'm just sort of curious, you know, like what, what empowers you to be outspoken at times? Because it's quite rare for public officials to, to be so bold, both in Australia and, and in the US and sort of globally, I would say. 
I mean, I'm in this position because, as I said, it's important to have a variety of views. And I think that I think very highly of the agency I work for, but I think we can do better. And, and that's, I think, part of my role is to push us to do better. And one of the areas that we can do better is how we think about innovation. And crypto presents us an opportunity really to rethink how we approach innovation. It also presents us an opportunity for people who don't typically deal with the SEC to interact with the agency. And I just, I really think we've been taking an approach that is not appropriate. And so I want people who are, who are working on crypto or other things to know that there are people at the SEC who are hearing what they have to say, um, who do want to take a different approach. And I think that that, it, it, it really, I mean, if, if I can't speak my mind on these things, then I, I don't know why I'm in that position. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. I, yeah, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, I hope, hopefully, you know, ASIC here in Australia, you know, will, will continue and, uh, you know, be open to, to um, providing guidance and working with, um, you know, the, the blockchain and crypto industry here in Australia. Um, what, what challenges relating to crypto do you think are the most critical for the US to resolve at present? I think it's really pretty basic. It's as, as regulators, it's our job to set rules and then allow people to try things. And it's not our job to decide whether those will succeed or fail. It really is just setting that framework and then letting it go and letting people decide what they like and what they don't like. And we have a moment where we could do that. We're, we're not we're not taking advantage of that right now. Um, and so I think for, for us, the biggest challenge is really time in the sense of how much time are we gonna spend before we just buckle down and do the hard work. Now that said, Congress is very interested in issues around crypto. And, and um, we recently saw a house bill introduced that would set up a pretty comprehensive framework for crypto markets. There's interest in the Senate. There, in the last Congress, a, a bill was introduced by Senators Lummis and Gillibrand that also would take a pretty comprehensive approach. And so one possibility is for that to happen through congressional work. But the agencies, my agency, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the banking agencies can also be doing things to lay the groundwork within which this um, industry can develop. I mean, clearly 2022 was a reminder to everyone, regulators and non-regulators alike, that there are certain issues that no matter what industry you're talking about, if you have centralized entities, there are going to be bad actors who, who take advantage of other people. And so you need to have some sort of a regulatory framework around that. That said, I mean, obviously the industry itself can do things like pay attention to counterparty risk. I think Caitlin was just mentioning leverage, you know, pay attention to leverage, pay attention to conflicts of interest. Those are things you don't need a government regulator to tell you to do, but I think government regulators can play a role in that. So we can certainly be thinking about what frameworks would make sense that would address those concerns around centralized counterparties but would also, um, you know, allow for adjustments to the regulatory framework to accommodate unique aspects of this technology. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just thought I should mention as well, because uh, when, when we were talking leading up to, to hosting this event, so if anyone has any questions, um, please put those in the chat, because I, I will leave some time um, to, to go through. Um, those. So if anyone has any questions in the audience for Commissioner Peirce, please um, type, type those in and we'll, we'll get to those at the end. Um, our, our legislators and policymakers here in Australia have been um, taking, I would say, a more of a reserved approach to regulating crypto. I sort of acknowledged that earlier in the conversation. Um, I think particularly compared to say our, our APAC neighbors, you know, up in Singapore and Hong Kong, 
um, but also, you know, when you consider Europe and, and, and the UK too. Um, I think perhaps, you know, it might be fair that they might be waiting on some of the actions that are ongoing in, in the US. And I know, obviously, you can't talk about ongoing actions. And, um, that, that's not the purpose of the question. But I'm just curious, like, recognising that we have different systems of government as well, between the US and, and Australia in terms of, um, you know, how our um, federations are set up. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any broad advice, um, you, you know, on how Australia could could approach um, regulating crypto and, um, you know, is, is speed of the essence, um, is, it, is it better to, to sit back and ha have a more reserved approach? How, how, how would you, if you had a, a blank whiteboard, how would you go about regulating crypto? Well, I would say there's something to be said for a reserved approach, but it has to be a reserved approach that's combined with, um, enough clarity that people feel that they can try things in your jurisdiction. Um, and with, you know, clearly you can't be reserved and then all of a sudden come in five years later with a bunch of enforcement actions. So I would recommend that you sort of have a game plan for how you're going to think about the activities now before there's a framework in place and then how you're going to, you know, how you're going to learn about approaches and the industry and think about the regulatory approach. Um, you know, there is something to be said again for not putting a framework in place that is so inflexible that it doesn't accommodate the new uses of crypto and blockchain. And I think that, you know, we now think of crypto in very financial terms, but there, there are a lot of potential uses. You know, the idea, I think, one of the powerful ideas of the technology is that you can bring together people who don't know each other and, and enable them to interact with each other in a way that doesn't require them to have a centralized intermediary. And that's useful in the financial context, but it's also useful in, you know, building a social media platform or whatever else. I mean, again, I'm not the technologist or the innovator here, but I, I, I think we have to make sure that whatever regulatory framework you have doesn't just assume that everything is financial asset. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, I, we're starting to get some questions in, so um, I might um, ping a couple of those off to you if that's all right. Um, sure. This is an interesting one that's, you know, been in the media a little bit, but um, thank you, James, for, for raising it. And um, could, could you share your thoughts on whether layer one assets like Ether qualify as securities? Oh, I knew that. That's a, that's a question that was sort of like the, the, the big elephant in the room question. I have avoided personally um, speaking about whether I think particular assets, crypto assets or securities. And, and the reason that I've avoided that, um, I mean, there, there are multiple reasons, but I think for me, the key reason is that I have tended to think about um, the analysis a bit differently than my colleagues do. So you may have a situation where a token was sold in, an, in a securities offering initially, um, but the, there's a separate question of whether the token itself is a security. And I think there, there's been academic work on this. Um, and um, there was a very extensive article written in the United States that kind of talked about how do you think about these things. In the United States, we have a long list of things that count as, you know, you can, you can have a stock, a bond, but there's a whole other list of things that count as securities in the United States. And the one that there's been a lot of attention on in the crypto world is an investment contract. And the investment contract idea is, is really quite a broad one. It, it says, you know, you're, you're taking something and you're selling it, but you're selling it together with promises that you're going to build something. And so that whole thing qualifies as a securities offering, but it doesn't necessarily take the, the how we how we test Orange Grove and turn that itself into a security. So in any event, I think we need to be pretty precise as we talk about these things. Um, I, I, it's not only the Howey test, we also talk about the Reeves test, which is kind of a notes analysis. Um, 
but but I think that um, it really is important for us to to be careful in thinking about this because then it affects well what happens to those tokens when they're actually being used for their purpose on the network. Is that still are those transactions still securities transactions? Um, so I think we really have to think through that whole analysis. Yeah, great. It's, it's it's slightly different to traditional securities. I, I definitely agree. It's complex. Yeah, and some of them, I mean, you know, there are some digital assets that have rights to, you know, basically ownership of something or, you know, some sort of dividend stream. There are a lot of different assets, and I think we we talk we tend to talk about everything as one sort of lump, but you really have to think about the unique characteristics. Absolutely, absolutely agree. Um, we've got another question. Uh, do we need to change the narrative in the ambiguous languages and how we explain what the positive outcomes of this technology and new approaches are? It's a broad, broad question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good question. It's good to be thinking about that because clearly we've gotten into kind of a negative narrative cycle. And, you know, some of that is certainly self-inflicted by, by uh, bad actors and, and bad, bad stories. Uh, and I think that a lot of people say, well, they look at this and they say, well, I don't see a lot of use cases. So why do I care? if we get the regulation right for crypto or not. And so I think having use cases out there is, is positive. It's, it's, it's helpful for people to see. Um, but I also think that there's a bit of smugness on the part of people who just write this whole thing off because yeah, there's been a lot of uncertainty, regulatory uncertainty all these years, which has kind of changed the nature of the innovation also. There's, a, there's definitely a connection between the two. If you build a framework within pe which people can comfortably innovate, they know what the rules are, they know that they can come and they can, um, they can ask, for example, for exemptive relief, or they know that they can get guidance on what they can and can't do, then there's gonna be a, a, a freer ability to innovate, but if you say to say to everyone in the traditional financial system, for example, you can't deal with crypto entities, and you say to everyone who who's trying to innovate in this area, you know, we're not going to tell you what you can you can and can't do um, in consistent with the law, then you're going to waste a lot of everyone's time. And so I think that yes, it's important to get the narrative right to point out how people are actually using these technologies now or realistically might use them in the future. Um, but it's also important for people in the regulatory system, whether or not they like crypto or believe in it or think it's gonna go somewhere to provide the room within which those positive stories can develop. Yeah, agreed. It goes back to your point earlier. It's not, um, it, it's not up to the SEC to decide which companies and, and which technologies survive and which ones don't. But yeah, yeah and there is, there is such a, you know, it's, it's understandable that regulators tend to fall into a merit regulatory approach because we see a lot of really bad conduct. You know, we're reviewing enforcement cases every week and you would be astounded at the terrible things that people do to each other. And so, you know, and, and there have been a lot of bad stories coming out of crypto. So it's understandable, but I think that's why people need to remind their regulators that their regulators do work for them and that you don't actually do your job as a regulator if you if all you do is just say we're going to stop anyone from trying anything new yeah no, i appreciate that um might try and finish on a bit of a fun question uh you've you know you're widely known with the nickname crypto mum uh, and and you you know you are a public figurehead in in this space and you know you've you've been um, outspoken in your advocacy for innovation um, you know not not crypto per se but innovation itself which is I think very healthy um, I'm just curious and I, I I don't want to fanboy out too hard but um, I'm just curious do you ever get like recognised when you're walking around in day to day life by you know crypto People. I got recognized once, um, but but uh, most of the time, 
people just, when I tell them I work at the SEC, they say, because in the US, the big SEC is the Southeastern Conference. It's a football conference. Yeah, and yeah. So yeah. when I work for the SEC, they think I'm talking about that. So that always brings me back down to, uh, down to, the, to, to the earth. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, college football is, uh, I lived in America for some time. College football is definitely a big thing. Saturdays would not be the same without college football in winter. That's uh, right. Um, yeah, well, uh, uh, um, Hester, Commissioner Purse, really honoured to um, ha have you with us. And, um, you know, on behalf of, you know, the industry here in Australia, really want to thank you. It's been an honour and I've enjoyed sitting across the internet from you and asking these questions and, and hearing your responses. Well, Simon, it's been great to talk to you. And I, I do want to emphasize that my door is open. I love hearing from people. Um, you know, you all are far away, but I'm happy to do, to do it by video. Or if you're in the U.S., please stop by. I'd love to hear what you're working on and how you think I can do, uh, to do, do better as a regulator. I think it's important for me to learn from you as well. So thank you all very much. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Purse. Have a great evening. Thank you. You as well. Or a good day, I guess. <laughs> Take care. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you so much. Take thank care. you. Well, that was amazing, wasn't it? So I think maybe you were star starstruck just as much as I was. Yeah, yeah. Really honoured to really honoured to have have her involved in um, blockchain week.